Johnson. Swing. This is going to be a home run. Unbelievable. Don't believe what I just saw. Hello, I'm Chris Fowler for Sports Century. Hank Greenberg not only carried a big stick, he carried a big burden, the burden of anti-Semitism. He bore both with uncommon valor. He bashed baseballs with a great sweeping stroke, and he battled bigotry with a noble restraint. Hank Greenberg demonstrated how a man of conviction can overcome prejudice. Hitler had risen to power in Germany. The rest of the world was beginning to become aware that this was not just some lunatic who was going to rise up and fall down and go away. And the people that he scorned were first and foremost Jews. The events in Europe were leading to the Holocaust, the beginning of the Holocaust. Judaism was under attack worldwide. The anti-Semitism as Nazism spread was coming to haunt the American Jewish community, and they needed a symbol, they needed a figure to rally around. The Jewish community in the 1930s is incredibly on the defensive. Not only what's going on in Europe, you know, discrimination against Jews is here too, in this country. Some people, you're never going to be anything but a Jew in a negative connotation. Jews are practically in the same position as blacks. They were just a lot on the bus and a better seat than a black person, but he was also a rejected human being. Detroit at that time was not a particularly a warm environment for Jews. There were signs, Jews and dogs, not welcome. Some of the wealthier Jewish people in the, outside the area had built a summer camp. As you walked around the lake, the signs were posted, Gentiles only. It was a time where Jews were very, very frightened. Henry Ford, America's greatest automobile maker, a candidate almost for the presidency of the United States, was also America's greatest anti-Semite. Henry Ford had a Dearborn Press that was a woeful anti-Semitic breed. He published a book called The International Jew. There was a father Coughlin who had a national radio show and who was a vitriolic anti-Semite and racist and that was one side of Detroit being portrayed nationally. My friend, may I pause to repeat what the whole world knows, that these financial institutions were dominated by international-minded Jews, warmongers. In the spring of 1933, when Hitler was taking control of Germany, a tall, quiet man with sure hands and a powerful swing began his rookie season with Detroit. Hank said that every day of his career, he was called some name from either the opposing dugout or from fans in the stands. Sheeny, Pike, Mo, Hans Presser. Back then, bench jockeys, we called Germans Krauts, Italians Wops or Dagos. And this was somewhat bruising, but as Greenberg said, hey, I was the only Jew. When Hank began playing in the minor leagues, another player from the South said, Hank, tell me you're Jewish. I can't believe it. And Hank said, why? And the other player said, because I had heard that all Jews have horns in their head, like the devil. However painful his isolation, Greenberg refused to follow the example of some other major leaguers by changing his name to one with a more acceptable sound. Raised an Orthodox Jew, he was deeply proud of his heritage and quick to defend it against all comers. American League managers would yell at him from the dugout derisively, throw a pork chop past him, he'll never hit a pork chop. I felt awful sorry for Hank Greenberg. Oh, they used to give that Jewish boy a rough, rough, tough time. Oh, they call him Christ killer and all that sort of thing. One day, Hank went into the White Sox clubhouse and challenged the White Sox team, saying, I don't like what you guys were saying to me, and I'm not going to take it. I want the guy that called me a yellow Jew SOB stand up. And Hank walked in front of all the lockers and looked back at all of them and left. 
The guy that said that was the luckiest guy in the world because Hank would have killed him. I was pitching once, and and the uh, guy from the other dugout were yelling, hey, Hitler's looking for you. Hank came over to me, did you hear what he said? And that's when I threw at him. When I hit him, he got the first base, and Hank said to him, don't run in the dugout after it's over with because I'm going after you. In fact, I had the feeling that some of our own players had that feeling about them. I was able to tell by the way they associated with Hank, they would stay away from him. Eisenstadt told me that one of the pieces of advice that Hank gave him early on was not to play cards for money with the other players. He was afraid that I kept winning all the time and he didn't want them to have any comments, so that's why he says, I, if I were you, I'd cut it out. In his third season, Greenberg was voted MVP after knocking in 170 runs, 51 more than runner-up Lou Gehrig, as he led Detroit into the 1935 World Series against Chicago. The Cubs were on his case so hard, so offensive, that the home plate umpire, George Moriarty, stopped the game, went over to the Cubs bench, and said, I'm going to clear this bench and throw everybody out of this game other than the nine players playing if you don't stop it right now. Moriarty went over there to tell us to kind of keep our language down and don't use too many cuss words, otherwise I'm going to clean the bench out. He talked about how much it hurt his feelings to have people yell those things, but as a competitor, his reaction was ultimately anger that turned into determination to show them they didn't know what they were talking about. He turned it around by being more determined to prove that he would succeed and that the guys who were hurling abuse at him would someday uh, stare at him in amazement as he succeeded. He says, well, there are too many Jewish people that because they didn't do well in whatever they're trying to do, would be a cop out because they were Jewish. We don't want to use that as a crutch. He took great pride in excelling as a Jew in the midst of this anti-Semitic furor. He did, in fact, once say that he felt every home run he hit in 1938 was a home run against Hitler. Hank was the perfect standard bearer for Jews. He was smart, he was proud, and he was big. Hank did break stereotype of Jews being small, bookish people. People did not expect Jews to be good athletes. I had a high school coach one time ask me why I was out for football, and I said, because I love it. He said, well, you're different than most Jews because Jew boys don't like contact sports. Hank Greenberg was a tough Jew when tough Jews were important. Greenberg came along at a time when American Jews needed a way of defining themselves as tough. He didn't choose to be a person who had to lead a people and raise their self-esteem. He probably would have rather just been a baseball player and judged by his record. In September of 1934, Greenberg's baseball and religious imperatives collided. Leading the second place Yankees by just four games with 20 to play, Detroit needed his thundering bat. But many in the Jewish community wanted him out of the lineup and in the synagogue on Rosh Hashanah. There was pressure on him to decide whether or not to play on one of the holiest of the Jewish holidays, the Jewish New Year. He was not a religious person. If he had been a religious person, there would have been no decision. Because as we all know, if you're a religious Jew, you don't play on Rosh Hashanah. He desperately wanted to play. Someone found an obscure passage in the Talmud which declared, that the children would play in the streets of Jerusalem on that day. The fact that they were Roman children, not Jewish children, sort of uh, slipped by those who were attempting to make this explanation. Greenberg racked his brain for the right call from God and finally decided after consultation with several rabbis that it was okay to play on Rosh Hashanah. I went out and loosened up and I came back just to the start of the game and here Hank was ready to go. I was never so happy to see anybody in my life as I was to see him. We won the ball game two to one, and Hank Greenberg hit two home runs that day. 
The next morning in one of the Detroit papers, a banner across the top was in Hebrew, Happy New Year. There were Hebrew words. Hebrew words. The Shana Tova Tika Tevu. May you be inscribed for a good year, a year of happiness, a year of fulfillment. It was as though the voice of the Jewish community had now entered the orchestration of the American way of life. If playing baseball on Rosh Hashanah was acceptable to many in the Jewish community, playing nine days later on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the holiest of holy days, was not. Either way he turned, Greenberg faced a firewall of opposition. The issue of religion in conflict, playing the game, swept the entire city and indeed the country as a whole. He understood that he really could not play. It was a larger community, his family, his friends and those who looked up to him who would be bitterly and forever disappointed if he played on Yom Kippur. It said something about Hank, that the holiday meant more to him. We respected him for that. Hank Greenberg isn't playing, it's Yom Kippur and Hank Greenberg isn't playing. The scene is the large synagogue in that part of Detroit. Dramatic moment, Hank Greenberg walks into the synagogue, the holiest day of the Jewish calendar declares, as it were, by his presence, his identification with the heritage of his people. I remember everybody, even though prayers were being said, turned around in a flash and started buzzing to each other. And I was just astonished. And the rabbi slapped his fist on the podium and tried to restore order. There was a stream of humanity that surged around him. Children stood on chairs to see Hank Greenberg, the legend, had come to celebrate the holy day of the year. He used to say that the one time he really felt like a hero was when he walked into Sherrod Zedek Synagogue in the middle of the high holiday services. And I think that was certainly the beginning of his recognition that he meant something to the Jews in Detroit that transcended what he did on the ball field. He wasn't doing it as a way to get other people to act the way he did. He was doing it to act properly in the eyes of his fellow Jews. Because of this one moment in time, Greenberg's stature as an American Jewish hero skyrocketed. I won a doubleheader in 39 against Philadelphia. And Hank Greenberg hit three home runs manager at the time said, fellows, lock yourself in your rooms tonight because the Jews of Detroit are going crazy. To his tribesmen, to his people, he was uh, very much available. When he would walk home from services after the holidays, he would make it a point to stop and, and chat with the people on their porches. Every time they played, I'd manage to go up to the game and bring a couple of sandwiches, and I slipped them to him. Nova Scotia sturgeon and cream cheese. I'm a bagel. Ah, how he loved them. The Tigers had brought the Hebrew school kids to a ball game, and one of them yelled out in, in Yiddish, I'm hungry. And Greenberg beckoned a peanut vendor over, and he said, take care of him and charge it to me. My dad used to tell the story of the time he came out of Yankee Stadium as a young player to find his father, my grandfather, standing there signing autographs. And the kids, in total amusement, looking at the ball as if they were mystified. So my father finally went over and took one of the balls, and my grandfather was signing his autograph in Hebrew. He transformed public's response to him. It was now not only no longer fashionable to call him a kite, it would earn you a punch in the mouth. Everything about him, you could see that this was a man. A mensch. There was nothing you could look at in a negative way. He had to help the Jewish image. He gave to the name Jew and to the Jewish community itself an honor, a nobility, a dignity that lifted their hearts. Jews need their great authors, their great scientists. We also need our athletes. We need our Hank Greenbergs. It was the kind of culture where everybody was scrapping for a living. The Jewish population, they had come over to America. 
Many of them had no means to make a living. My grandparents were Orthodox Jews, coming from the old country as they did, and very observant. His father was in the cloak business, in the dyeing process. I guess his father thought he would get into that. Born on New Year's Day, 1911, to David and Sarah Greenberg in Manhattan's Greenwich Village, Henry Benjamin was the third of four children. Hank would tell the story like at Halloween, running from some of the Gentile kids who were beating up on the Jewish kids, and they would put coal in a sock and chase the kids and hit them. So there were neighborhoods that also were very clearly marked. Uh, you didn't step over the boundary without running a risk, if you were a Jewish boy walking into an Italian neighborhood, of being attacked as a Christ killer. By the time Hank entered James Monroe High School, the Greenbergs had moved to the Bronx, where his passage through adolescence was painful. He was very uncomfortable in his own skin as a young man. He was exceedingly tall, had acne, uh, was gangly, was a little uncoordinated. I think he was extremely shy. He probably didn't learn a lot of social graces growing up in the kind of household that he did. Everything was off, and he was very conscious of how uncomfortable he felt. And the one outlet for him was to go out on the ball field where his size actually worked to his benefit. From sun up till sundown, grab a handful of apples, throw them in his sack, go out to Cretona Park and stay there all day. My dad was a uh, hog of the bat and he would occasionally let his younger brother take a few cuts and then send him back out to shag. Joe would plead, come on Hank, I want to you have a couple of bats and so Hank was exhausted he said okay so Joe took a couple of hits Hank got his energy back he's okay Joe out of the batter's box I'm back in he built himself a homemade sliding pit he would run down the alley make a left-hand turn as if rounding the base behind the house and practice his sliding in the sliding pit in the backyard the mother's cluck poor mrs. Greenberg young Henry doesn't want to do anything but play ball her son was a no-good Nick, a near-do-well. He didn't want to go to school. In Jewish families, you don't earn a living by playing kids' games, marbles, spin the dreidel. You're going to go to school. You're going to be a doctor, a lawyer. They always felt that baseball players were just bums. It's just something that you don't make a living playing chasing a little white ball. My grandfather was a somewhat stern authoritarian. Only one of the four children disappointed my grandparents, of course, and that was my dad, who dropped out to be a ball player. For Greenberg, there could be no better showcase than a city with three major league teams and the largest Jewish population in America. The owners of the teams knew that there was a certain benefit to having a Jewish athlete. And the famous story about John McGraw going around looking for a Jewish athlete in the late 1920s to really find somebody whom he could use to attract Jews to the ballpark. John McGraw, who was manager of the Giants at the time, had word sent to him that young Hank Greenberg at James Monroe High School wanted to come and shag balls and have a tryout for the Giants. Word came back that McGraw had seen him play and didn't think he'd ever make it, so not to even bother coming out for a tryout. The Yankees had a famous scout back then named Paul Critchell, and Critchell wooed Greenberg carefully. They were sitting in front row box seats on the Yankee dugout side. And Gehrig came out, and Critchell whispered to Greenberg, this guy is over the hill now. You'll be playing first base for the Yankees in a couple of years. My dad looked at Gehrig and said his shoulders looked like they were four feet across. His legs looked like tree trunks. And my dad said, he's not going to be washed up for a long time. Greenberg thought to himself, no, no, no. I don't want to play in this guy's shadow. So he politely looked elsewhere. Tiger Scout was shrewd enough to tell my grandfather that he had been a Princeton graduate and he would arrange to get a scholarship for my dad and that sealed the deal with my grandfather. In 1929, the 18-year-old first baseman enrolled not at Princeton, which was 60 miles outside the city, but at New York University. After one semester at NYU, he could just feel himself out on the diamond and he quit college and went to play ball. And here's Hank Greenberg, first baseman and heavy hitter of the Tigers. Genius is the art of re remaining under the spell of an obsession. It was very true for Hank Greenberg. He set his sight on becoming a great baseball player. He 
focused on nothing else. For Greenberg, breaking into the Detroit lineup in 1933 propelled him to work ever harder at the prospect of greatness. I imagine there were others that had the, as much talent as Hank had, but they didn't have the determination to improve. He carried a briefcase and wore a suit and on road trips as if he were going to work at an office. He would practice hitting until his hands bled. He would stand in front of a mirror swinging to make sure his technique was correct. He would go to the ballpark and he would get a bucket of balls and he would soak the balls in water so they became soggy. Then he would swat these heavy balls as far as he could. If he was in a slump, he would say, Izzy, how about throwing to me? We used to meet at 9 o'clock in the morning and I used to throw to him so that he'd get back in the groove. And he always wore a heavy, heavy undershirt. Whoa, no, no matter how hot it was. And he would sweat. I never saw anybody who wanted to work out and perspire as much as Hank Greenberg. They had an afternoon game against the A's, and he went out at 10 in the morning and had the peanut vendors throwing balls to him when he was hitting. And the groundskeeper saw this and said, what are you doing here? Get off the field. And there was an old gentleman sitting way up in the shadows who says, no, no, let this young man hit, and it was Connie Mack. After an injury limited him to 12 games in 1936, Greenberg returned with a vengeance the following season. Hitting 337 with 40 homers, he knocked in 183 runs, just one shy of Lou Gehrig's American League record. Strong, big hands. He had a tremendously quick pair of wrists. I was a scoreboard boy for the Washington Senators, and I saw a lot of the Detroit Tigers. I've seen very few ball players who I would actually call lordly. To me, Greenberg was such, and you never confuse Greenberg with anybody else. He used to sit and just stare at the pitcher. As you're pitching, you're conscious of the fact that he's staring at me. What am I doing wrong? You saw a fellow with three bats and swinging them as hard as like they were toothpicks. You're pitching to the guy ahead of him. You take a peep over there just to look to see what he was doing. There was one pitcher that he just had trouble with. So one day he passed his pitcher and he turned to him and said, I've got your number now. I know how you've been getting me out and that's over. I own you now. That day my dad hit it out of the park and he said nothing had changed other than the psychology of their relationship. Nobody could hit a ball any further than Hank Greenberg if he got a hold of one. Left field in those days in Detroit, was Cherry Street. There were houses over there. And he'd knock them into those houses over there across the street. Every time you threw a ball, you felt your head go down <laughs> for fear that he was going to hit through the middle. We were in Boston, and Fritz Ostermiller was a left-handed pitcher. And Hank hit that ball and hit Fritz, was shattered his jawbone and knocked teeth out of his mouth. In 1938, Greenberg took up hot pursuit of what had become baseball's most coveted seasonal mark, 60 home runs. Hitting four homers and as many at-bats over two games in late July, the six-year veteran surged ahead of Ruth's record-setting pace of 11 seasons earlier. The newspaper men, they built everything up. They would talk about what he did, what he didn't do, and what the pitchers were getting him out. Did he hit one today? Will he hit one tomorrow? We go home and or go to the drugstore to find out what happened. How'd Hank do? You know, that'd be the first question. You start to see in the paper, oh, he hit one yesterday again. I, oh, every day you were watching. Suddenly, that becomes your sole goal and obsession. The toll that it took was significant. There was a great deal of pressure. I know at night, he was uneasy. Izzy, let's go for a walk. Why are they getting me out on that pitch? Because that's a pitch I used to hit all the time. I said, a couple of times, I think that uh, you're a little anxious. Anxious or not, the pressure mounted as Greenberg was pushing 50 homers with 21 games remaining. I had to ask him, did they not throw to you so that a Jew wouldn't break Babe Ruth's record? And he said to me, absolutely not. I don't think there's any question, there was never any question in his mind, that they pitched him. Against St. Louis, I had two home runs in that game. 
and Hank never hit the ball out of the infield. I said to Hank, I said, here, why don't you take these two home runs? They're not going to do me any good. He said he'd like to have them. I hope you hit that record today and beat it, Hank. Well, I'm going to be trying, you can be sure. With 58 homers and five games to play, Greenberg stood on the verge of history. But for three games, he was denied. On the final day of the season, the Tigers played a doubleheader in Cleveland. In the first game, Greenberg faced strikeout sensation Bob Feller. I had good stuff that day, and Hank never could hit me. He knew it. Everybody in the ballpark knew it. He had a shot at the 60 home runs, and nobody gives anything to anybody to break a record. Of Feller's record 18 strikeouts that afternoon in Municipal Stadium, three belonged to Greenberg. In the second game, Ruth's challenger hit three singles before the game was called because of darkness. There were no lights, and there just was no way after six innings, the umpire Moriarty turned to my dad and said, you know, Hank, I think this is as far as we can go. And he said, that's OK, George. It's been a long season, and uh, let's pack it in. In 1940, Detroit Brass was eager to bring up a young slugger named Rudy York, whose range limited him to first base, Greenberg's home for the last seven seasons. They asked Greenberg, would he switch to the outfield, which he didn't know how to play. And Greenberg said, sure. When Stengel tried to get DiMaggio to play first base, DiMaggio would play there one day, was embarrassed, and wouldn't do it anymore, back to the outfield. Greenberg knew how good he was. He wasn't afraid to be embarrassed for the good of the team. From left field, Greenberg wasted no time becoming the first player ever to win MVP awards at two positions. He hit 340 while leading the league with 41 homers and 150 RBIs. In May of 1941, Greenberg felt a tap on his shoulder. Greenberg, $50,000 idol of the Detroit Tigers and home run king of the American League, goes to bat for the last time before joining the Army. He's sure giving the fans something to remember him by. The lanky New Yorker turns in his famous number five uniform to manager Del Baker. Hank's taking a $49,000 salary cut and happy to do it. Well, this is goodbye. We're still to work with you. It's kind of tough to leave baseball, but when your country calls, there's nothing to do but respond. When he went in the service in the beginning of 1941, I said, you're Williams hit 400 and DiMaggio was a big star. Greenberg was a better hitter than either of them at that time. He just was. Later that year, 1941, Congress enacted another law saying that men who were in service but were 30 years old would be discharged immediately. So Greenberg is discharged December 5th, 1941. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. War against Japan was declared on December 8th, and Hank turned right around and enlisted again. He felt it was the right thing to do. The United States Army were very anxious to get celebrity enlistments because the draft machinery was still oiling up. So when Greenberg re-enlisted, uh, oh my gosh, that was a wonderful thing. So this is my message to you young men of 17 or close to it. Uncle Sam is calling upon you to go at once to your nearest Army recruiting station with your parents' consent, of course, and join the Air Corps Enlisted Reserve. Thanks very much, Captain Hank Greenberg. He served the next four years, partly in the U.S. and partly overseas, and part of his duty was flying over the hump, over the Himalayas. And I know he had a few close calls where people were hoping, as they were bouncing around, that they'd get through and not hit the side of the mountain. Just as Greenberg was one of the first players to enlist after the attack on Pearl Harbor, he was among the first to be discharged when the fighting was over in Europe. He was now 34 years old, and being out of baseball for over four years, did he have any skills left? And I guess a lot of people looked at this as a kind of test case. Hank, for hours, would go in, into the batting cage, and his hands were raw when he finished working out. On July 1st, 1945, just 17 days after his discharge, Greenberg hit a homer in his first game back as a Tiger. For Hank Greenberg to go to the war and be a great player as soon as he comes back is inconceivable to me, given the difficulty of the game. 
On the last day of the season, Detroit needed to beat the St. Louis Browns in order to win the pennant. The Browns are ahead by a run, ninth inning in St. Louis. Hank sat down next to me, and I was fortunate to hear him say to me, I'm going to get Moncrief. I know what he's doing. When he goes back with his arms and his hands in his wind-up position and stops at the peak of his cap, it's a slider. When he goes back to his neck, it's a fastball. When Hank came up with the bases loaded, and he teed off on that ball, and that type of ball that's hit generally curves 20, 30 feet into foul territory. But that ball stayed six, eight inches fair. Propelled by Greenberg's two homers and seven RBIs, the Tigers beat the Cubs in the 1945 World Series. The following year, at 35, he had a vintage season, winning his fourth home run in RBI titles. But though he seemed like the same player, winds of change had blown through Greenberg during the war years. Up until 1941, baseball was his life. After World War II, he understood that there were bigger issues in the world, and he used to say that when he went to the war, he saw religion tearing people apart. He was very turned off by organized religions, the hatred between the people, and the devastating wars. I had tremendous trouble with that. While Greenberg struggled to resolve his internal conflicts, his career received an unexpected jolt from owner Walter Briggs. Mr. Briggs saw a picture taken during the war, my dad holding up a Yankee jersey, and the caption, of course, was, does Hank want to end his career with the Yankees, question mark, which had nothing to do with the photograph, and said, get rid of him. He was gone before anybody knew it, hardly. Some of us didn't even know he'd gone until we read the paper the next day. If you talk about bad taste in his mouth, there really was only one in his entire baseball career, and that was when he was sold from the Tigers to the Pirates in 1947. He and my mother heard the news on the radio that his contract had been waived to Pittsburgh in the National League. In order to persuade a dispirited Greenberg to play, Pirates owner John Galbraith made him the first $100,000 player. When Hank Greenberg came from the Detroit Tigers to the Pittsburgh Pirates in 1947, Hank Greenberg saw the potential in this young Ralph Kiner. Our manager uh, wanted to send me out, and Greenberg went to the uh, management. Hank said, don't send the guy out. He's going to hit. I was very uh, honored the fact that he took me more or less under his wing, and in, in a way it was like a big brother to me. In what would be his final season, Greenberg hit 25 homers and had the opportunity to reach out to a certain embattled Brooklyn rookie. The two of them collided. Robinson was knocked down. Greenberg helped him up. Hank said, Jackie, you're going to be a great player. Don't listen to all this stuff. Robinson said that Hank was the first opposing player to encourage him, that class stands out all over Mr. Green. My dad had the great fortune of sitting next to Bill Veck at the 1947 World Series, and they started talking baseball. Veck at the time was the principal owner of the Indians. They left the game, they went to touch shores, and by the end of the evening, Veck said, you gotta come to Cleveland with me, Hank. While Veck may have hoped that Greenberg would play for Cleveland in 1948, what he got was an extremely active shareholder, and two years later, a GM every bit as tough at the negotiating table as he had been as a player. There's no doubt in my mind that he was responsible for building the farm system that gave the Indians these great teams until he left. Hank was the general manager, and all I can remember about him, he was awful tough to get a buck out of. He was the toughest man I ever met. In 1953, I had my breakout year. I walked into his office, and he said, let's see, you hit 336. That's the year I hit 363. And this was my fourth year, and he's comparing his fourth year. By the time I walked out of there, I thought I had a bad year. During his 10-year stay in Cleveland, Greenberg and his wife, Carol, whom he had married in 1946, had three children. But it wasn't long before their relationship began to fail. My mother and father came from different worlds. My mother was heiress of the Gimbel department store. My father was son of a Romanian immigrant who was a ball player. I think it was just a poor match, not well considered. 
great love match, but just a poor choice of partner. So it was a very stormy 12 years, which ended with great disappointment for my father. When we return to Sports Century, in retirement, Hank Greenberg ponders his spiritual identity. His attitude was that if Jews could live peaceably in society and not be abused as he had been during the 30s and 40s, and there was no reason to cause your family to stand out in the way that you were forced to stand out. After several seasons in the White Sox front office, Greenberg, now divorced and with custody of his children, settled in New York City in the early 1960s. My dad was a very spiritual person. He took the Ten Commandments as his code of living. What he did not believe in was organized religion. I didn't find out I was Jewish until I was 13 when he said, you know, when you become 13, Glenn, you become a man in the Jewish faith. And as a token of your reaching manhood, I'm giving you this ring, which my father gave to me. And I was stunned because this was the first time I'd heard anything about it. One day when the boys, I think, were 11 and 13 years old, he says, today, you're not going to school. Today is a special day. My father felt that Yom Kippur was you know, a specially important day to celebrate. He didn't know really where to take us. He couldn't take us to temple, so he would try to take us to some place that was sort of solemn. They go not to a synagogue. He takes them to the planetarium. We went inside, and I'm, I still get goosebumps thinking about it, and we looked up at the stars, and it was probably about 20 or 30 minutes, and then finally said, okay, kids, let's go, and we left. But in his way, it was a very spiritual experience. In 1974, Greenberg and his second wife, Mary Jo, moved to Beverly Hills, where he divided his time between tennis and successfully playing the stock market. In 1983, Greenberg went back to the place he graced with all manner of greatness, to celebrate the retirement of his number. Our next hero came from New York City, and he was the big gun. For 12 years, he provided the Tigers with his home run punch. Dedicated, determined, he was Detroit's home run hero, Hank Greenberg. When I think of all the great ball players that have graced the Detroit uniform over the years, I am very proud of the fact that my name and my number will always be remembered as long as baseball is played in Detroit. In October of 1984, doctors discovered a cancerous tumor in one of Greenberg's kidneys. My dad, till he got sick, woke up every morning feeling like he did when he was 30 years old. When he got sick, he said to me once, I just can't believe that my body's let me down. I think Hank thought he had at least 15 more years that body was going to be there for him. And it wasn't. Hank felt that his body was betraying him. He didn't understand this, was angry about it, would be short with people. In August of 1985, Greenberg quietly entered Cedars Sinai Hospital in Los Angeles and had the tumor surgically removed. He didn't tell any of his friends and none of his family other than his children and his, his wife, my stepmother, that he was sick. It was a terrible year because we were making up fictitious stories. It was a peculiar thing, almost like he felt it was a humiliation for him not to be able to continue to perform. Every New Year's Eve, we celebrated with four other couples. I didn't know whether to have the party. We had the party, it was great. And like one in the morning, Hank's holding court. So everyone left that evening thinking, Hank was fine, only had a bad back. He didn't believe he was dying and he didn't want to be told he was dying by his doctors. I remember going out there. In my mind, it was going to see him for the last time and in his mind, it was I was paying him a visit. The first time I saw my dad totally fall apart was in his hospital room. It was the first time that he really recognized that he was going to die. First time that I ever saw him scared. But here was this guy who was seemingly invincible, overcame all sorts of obstacles thrown in his way, and finally met the one that he couldn't conquer. I felt badly when people would call up and I knew loved and adored Hank. If they were going to hear he died, I never got to see him. But that's what he wanted. It was okay. It was okay. One of baseball's greatest sluggers, Hank Greenberg, died today at his home in Beverly Hills at the age of 75. 
He had been fighting cancer for more than a year. I was on the air in Boston when they told me from the truck that he had died. And I was shocked. And I said over the air, I said, I can't believe this. This is the worst news I've ever heard. Upon hearing uh, of the death of Hank, uh, he turned to me and said, this is one of the most devastating moments of my life. I just lost the best friend I've ever had. When you start looking at the most underrated players of all time, Hank Greenberg comes up pretty high on the list. And I don't think he's ever gotten credit for the number of home runs that he hit in his career. The single season seasons that he had were phenomenal. But I think if you ask people, name the guys who hit 58 home runs, Hank Greenberg's name does not come up. He lost five years in a sense, right in the middle. He would have had over 500 home runs. He would have had a lot of things. So he's, he was forgotten a little bit. Some men have glory thrust upon them. I think he would have preferred a world where he wasn't singled out for any other reason than his accomplishments on the ball field. In retrospect, he came to understand what a symbol he was because he was doing what he did during the Depression, during the Holocaust. He realized what a beacon he was to the Jewish community. It meant a lot to him. I think he was a little in awe of it. He didn't think of himself as a hero. Because of the way he handled himself, because of the drive he had, because of the example he set, all those things made him bigger than life. He represented a race of people that had been downtrodden for 2,000 years. And I could understand how proud they were of him, rightfully so. And God bless him, he was a king. Hank Greenberg became an owner, but he always remained a player at heart. He helped create the first player's pension plan, and he fought to have the reserve clause abolished. In his eulogy, Ralph Kiner, who Greenberg had mentored and befriended, said, Hank taught me more than baseball. He taught me more about how to live, how to live the right way. For Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler.